come in, come in. Oh, welcome, come in. Nice to see you again. I've been doing yet more reshelving. I'm still not familiar enough with these the new positions of all the books, you know, since we moved house. But I was looking again. I was re-shelving some books on. The, you remember, I basically said that over here, but also behind some of the books over there, are what I call the slender volumes of modern poetry. Of course, there are bigger collected ones too, like that collected Heaney, which he kindly signed for me. But among Heaney's slender, here it is. Among Heaney's slender volumes, there's one. You can see it's rather well worn. It's got a beautiful cover. Had I not torn it, I think by then spilling coffee on it and then picking something else up that had the coffee on it, it's rather unfortunate. Come and have a seat. Um, but it's well worn in the sense that see the creases on the spine. I found this book uh, hugely enlightening. It came out in 1996. This is a, a first edition, uh, or first paperback edition anyway, and um, which was after, it was after he had received the Nobel Prize for Literature. And um, it must be very difficult actually producing the, your first book after such an extraordinary honour because the level of expectation is so high and I know lots of people I know from my own experience if you're a writer and you you want people to love and understand your work of course you're glad in some quiet way when it's praised but then when it's praised that raises the expectation in you you can sometimes use that sort of thing to crush yourself but he needs him to because he's very deeply rooted very as I know having met him very humble man, right even in the midst of all the honours that were showered upon him. He stayed rooted and um, he, he was not inhibited. And this little book, which is called The Spirit Level, is one of his very best. The Spirit Level is a great title. There's a poem in it called The Spirit Level. And of course, the Spirit Level is that thing that you use uh, in building to put to make sure that something is flat it has a it has a little uh, bubble inside a a file of of spirits um set inside a kind of ruler and if the, if the bubble is right in the middle then you know you you're got things fair and square and if the bubble bubble moves you know you haven't got an absolute flat surface it's a brilliant simple little invention and the poem mentions that uh, as a sort of wind up of new apprentices on building sites, the foreman would summon one out and say, go to the workshop and ask them for a new bubble for the spirit level. Uh, that poor chap, if he didn't know what it was, would be going and asking for it. And of course, in a sense, the, the bubble in the spirit level works to keep the measures right by being nothing, in a sense, by being a gap in what things are. But the idea of poetry, well, obviously he's playing on the word spirit, and the idea of poetry as as something that rather like um, in the Bible, there's that story about the plumb line descending and uh, from heaven and being able to see whether things are straight. So it's a beautiful title. The opening book, the opening poem, The Rain Stick, I may have read to you before, I, I, uh, that became a sort of absolutely formative poem for me. But I was reading it again and it's actually not The Rain Stick, it's a kind of story poem called St. Kevin and the Blackbird, which I'd like to read to you. Um, and it's, it's, it's in some ways a very light poem and in other ways uh, incredibly suggestive poem. And what, what struck me when I reread it just recently was how it had entered into my own poetry. I hadn't realised how much I owed, not to the conscious memory, but to an enlargement of possibility in my imagination given by this retelling by Heaney of a, a classic early saint's tale about St Kevin and the Blackboard bed. It's written in um, kind of tercets. They're not rhymed, um, but they're very beautifully and carefully written in ways that um, that uh, uh, it's two sets of four tercets. Uh, the line endings are very beautifully done. But let me just let just you know sit comfortably and enjoy this because it it's Heaney in storytelling mode. And then there was Saint Kevin and the Blackbird. The saint is kneeling arms stretched out inside his cell but the cell is narrow so one upturned palm 
is out the window, stiff as a crossbeam, when a blackbird lands and lays on it and settles down to nest. Kevin feels the warm eggs, the small breast, the tucked neat head and claws, and finding himself linked into the network of eternal life is moved to pity. Now, he must hold his hand uh, like a branch out in the sun and rain for weeks until the young are hatched and fledged and flown. There's a little star. It's part two now. And since the whole thing's imagined anyhow, imagine being Kevin. Which is he? Self-forgetful or in an agony all the time from the neck on, out, down, through his hurting forearms. Are his fingers sleeping? Does he feel his knees? Or has the shut-eyed blank of underneath crept up through him? Is there distance in his head, alone and mirrored clear in De Love's deep river? To labour and not to seek reward, he prays. A prayer his body makes entirely, for he has forgotten self, forgotten bird, and on the river bank, forgotten the river's name. Oh, <laughs> it's uh, beautiful. It's so vivid about, you know, feeling the warm eggs and the small breast and the tucked. What Kevin is doing is a thing the Celtic saints often did. I mean, Cuthbert did it too, which is called the cross vigil, where you stood to pray with your arms out like that, in a sense, being the cross and being in the cross and with the cross and the cross within you. A complete identification with Christ. And of course, it was a very painful thing to do and that was the point of it. But he, he takes it further. I mean, he d deals with the the uh, Kevin being moved to pity and the hand holding the bird. And what he gives you then is a sense in which the man is becoming a tree, or a tree is informing for a man what it is to to be a human being. There's an invitation to something that you might have seen in nature as outside yourself, the tree and the river, as being in some sense inside yourself. And it does a thing that I think imagination and imaginative poetry does particularly well, which is to ask open questions. And it's lovely, he tells the story and then he says, look, I'm, you know where this is an imaginary story. Well, let's get imagination on our side here. Since the whole thing's imagined anyhow, imagine being Kevin. Get inside that person. And then all these big questions, which is he? Self-forgetful or in agony? Are his fingers sleeping? Does he feel his knees? And then this wonderful evocation of uh, the body itself praying and almost becoming the tree. So I've, I've loved that poem. And uh, when I came to write, for example, I mean, I realise now it's entered into several of my poems, but in my Parable and Paradox, when, um, when I came to write about Jesus saying, I am the vine and you are the branches, my attempt to describe that, the, in fact, the very fact that I start that poem with an open question is because of something I learned from that Heaney poem. And yet I can tell you with assurance that I wasn't conscious of remembering the Heaney poem when I wrote what I'm going to read you. But rereading the Heaney poem, I realised that I learned something from one of the masters and I'm not ashamed to acknowledge that. Uh, in fact, I'm really delighted to do it. So I'm reflecting in this poem on <laughs> Jesus saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. And here's my poem, and as I, I, you'll see, my debt to Heaney. How might it feel to be part of the vine? Not just to see the vineyard from afar, or even pluck the clusters, press the wine, but to be grafted in, to feel the stir of inward sap that rises from our root, himself deep planted in the ground of love to feel a leaf unfold, a tender shoot, as tendrils curled unfurl, as branches give a little to the swelling of the grape in gradual perfection, round and full, to bear within oneself the joy and hope of God's good vintage till it's ripe and whole. What might it mean 
to bide and to abide in such rich love as makes the poor heart glad. And I realise now both the sense of becoming the vine and the way of writing, which was a series of open questions. And I'm indebted uh, to the master. And it's always good to turn back to those masters and mentors to whom one is indebted and learn the lessons afresh. Anyway, nice to see you and thanks for dropping round. Cheers.